Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming today for our wonderful lecture. My name is Pam Saltenberger. I'm the co-president of the Kingsley Art Club. I have a new co-president, and her name is Pam Trump, and she's right back there. So we're going to be dangerous. You know, you have two Pams at the same time. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, I'm wanting to just uh, quickly remind everyone that membership renewal is here, and I'm sure you've all received um, an e-blast from us. If you are not a member currently, I suggest that you go onto our website and join. Our dues are $75 uh, for an individual and $100 for a couple. And we do amazing things with the monies that we have. Uh, first of all, we're all volunteer. So everything that is done is done by people because they love art and love the Kingsley. Um, but I wanted to let you know some of the other things that we do. Um, we have these lectures. And sometimes we have eight. Sometimes we have nine in a year. Um, we're doing the Crocker Kingsley, which is a really large national juried show, and we've been having it at Blue Line Arts the last few years, um, and they're wonderful prizes for the artists. And then the Crocker, uh, Scott Shields, the chief curator, picks about five to seven pieces that are then shown here at the Crocker. So it's really kind of um, quite an honor for an artist to be shown here as well. Um, we also have a high school art show where every high school in our region is invited to participate. And we also have a community college art show uh, where community colleges in our region are also invited to participate. The winners of both of those um, receive cash awards and their work is hung here at the Crocker in the basement area of the historic building. And this year, we just took those exhibits down. But it's pretty amazing for students throughout our region to be able to have their work at the Crocker. Um, we also help the Crocker in some of their educational programs. One is Teacher to Teacher, and we've been supporting that for quite a few years. We have other outreach programs, uh, but one that we're very proud of is um, a five-year commitment we've made to the Crocker for the Kingsley Initiative. Um, this is a program where um, a artists from any of the underserved communities in our region receives uh, an award. It is either um, they become a lecturer at the Crocker, they curate um, a show, or one of their pieces of art is purchased to be uh, in the permanent collection. So this is um, an amazing, some of the amazing things that we do, and we do it because of dues and because of wonderful donations. And plus, it's fun. We do really kind of different and interesting things. So I encourage all of you to join if you aren't already. And for those of you that have joined, I think we have uh, 225 members so far. So please consider doing that. And you can enjoy all of these amazing lectures. And getting on to lectures, I'd like to introduce Scott Heckes, who's um, part of our outreach committee, and he will be introducing our speaker today. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming today. We really appreciate it. Uh, as Pam said, my name is Scott Heckes, and I'm a member of the Kingsley Art Club board. It's my honor today to introduce our speaker, my friend Lorraine Garcia Nakata. Uh, Lorraine and I have known each other for about 40 years. Um, our acquaintance began in 1984 at the California Arts Council where Lorraine was the visual arts specialist, interdisciplinary arts and community arts uh, specialist. And for a time I was her intern. So let's come full circle here. Uh, Lorraine is an artist, a writer, a musician, a cultural specialist, community activist, and cultural bearer. A resident in San Francisco since 1985, Lorraine has exhibited her work locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Her creative work navigates between disciplines including the visual arts, music, and writing. 
She's adept in a range of visual arts mediums. She is noted for her large-scale drawings, which we'll see quite a few uh, images of today, and paintings, as well as her command in mixed media, printmaking, installation work, ceramics, sculpture, and photography. Lorraine is a founding member of the Royal Chicano Air Force, the RCAF Artist Collective, and she's one of six muralists and the only woman uh, artist invited to paint Sacramento's historic Southside Park mural in 1977. Lorraine has been recognized for her contributions in numerous ways. In 2003, the California Arts Council awarded Lorraine a Visual Arts Fellowship. In 2008, she was a mayoral appointee as an arts commissioner with the San Francisco Arts Commission. In 2009, she was appointed by US Congress as a commissioner exploring the creation of a nat national museum of the American Latino. And in 2012, she's been a, since 2012, she's been a founding member of the San Francisco Latino Historical Society. In 2015, Stanford University Library Special Collections acquired the Lorraine Garcia Nakata Papers, and in that same year, her book, Chola Enterprises, was published by Copilot Press. In 2018, her book, Children's Stories for Adults, was published by BRC Publishing. In 2021, she was commissioned to produce seven large-scale murals at 1990 Folsom Street in San Francisco, and she's currently working on that project, and she'll be giving us an update today. Lorraine's talk will share the trajectory of her visual art and key concepts that have thread through her work over decades to the present. Please join me in welcoming Lorraine Garcia Nakata. Thank you so much for making time to um, be here on this very hot Sacramento day. It's really good to um, see so many, so it's kind of a very nice surprise. Um, I want to um, begin by uh, thanking William Ishmael and Scott, who just spoke, um, and others with the Kingsley Art Club, for the invitation to share my work. I hope that in viewing and hearing um, of my work that it may spark some so thoughts and insights that may be further illuminate your own life trajectory because as many of you know, art is not just as simple as producing artwork, but it's actually a journey. And for me, it's been, I'll kind of give you a sense of just some main chapters of my work. I'd like to acknowledge a few people in, in the room. Um, my brother, Carlos uh, Olivas, who is right here, and my nephew, Carlos Olivas Jr., and my grandniece and budding artist, Eva Lozen. And so thank you so much. I love you so much, and thank you for being here. <laughs> also, um, Debron Jones, uh, Reed, um, she's my, and Rye Purvis, and another artist, and Tere Romo, whom many of you already know, are my sisters in life. Uh, Stan Padilla, I think, might be here. Certainly Juan Carillo, our, our, our very interesting persona of the RCAF, is also here. And I understand that Gloria Woodlock also was going to try to make it. These are people that have threaded throughout my life and continue to, to do that. For artists, it's really important to be able to have a a community, um, and for many reasons that I'll hopefully touch on today. I spend a very special abrazo to my RCF Armando, uh, uh, hermano um, Juanishi Orozco, whom I visited yesterday. He's unable to be present due to his health. As many of you know, um, Ishi, Stan Padilla, and I are the three remaining RCF artists um, who painted the historic um, Sacramento Southside Park mural, along with our RCF hermanos, Jose Montoya, Armando Cid, Ricardo Favela, Esteban Villa, Juan Cervantes, and Sam Rios, who have already left us for the next flight. So I want to honor their, their names and their work and their legacy as I begin to speak. I will... Um, when I was five years old, actually, when I knew that I wanted to make a life as an artist, for me, there was never a question. The visual arts work I share with you today spans 1968 to the present, offering a sample of key um, phases and chapters and transitions of my work um, and that has navigated over time. 
Like Scott shared, I tend to enjoy working really large. Um, seven feet, six feet high is kind of a, a, a sort of a scale that I'm very comfortable with. And right now with these murals, um, those sort of stretch into two stories and three stories high. So um, it's, it's a sort of a labor of love during murals. It's an exhausting and um, at the same time really important piece of work, as all of you know, because murals has a long history of being able to communicate um, over time uh, to a larger group of people than maybe uh, uh, your personal friends or people that attend museums, galleries, and so forth. So um, working um, small, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it, it makes my brain pinch. So you will, <laughs> you will see some work um, when I was sort of taking on studying ex fotos and retablos of Mexico that are paintings on tin, and they traditionally are small pieces. And I think I did like four or five of those, and then my brain said, okay, you did that, so like, you know, move on. Um, I do owe um, sort of the idea of working larger and larger to um, my college uh, professor, Gilbert Azama, who is no longer with us, but he used to say, okay, now larger. And I'd come back, and he goes, okay, now larger. And so with each um, example of going larger, I began to really understand the power in it and, and also the impact of it. So, um, yes, I feel like I need to at least uh, note him in, in regard to like the impact of my life. Um, we are all you know, living our various lives and we are all um, witnessing, I think, what's going on out in the world and... and uh, it, there's there's a range of struggles that are going on um, and injustices, and then by extension, you know, we have our personal challenges as well. So, one of the things that has threaded through my work is a question. You know, I I like everyone else has become really upset over time, over the decades, especially as you know, women and and people of color about a whole host of things that have happened in the world and in our country in particular. And so, yes, when I was younger, I did like very overt um, protest work. And I begin with that in mind. And then my artistic mind says, OK, yes. But let's say that you have everything and you've acquired what you maybe have needed um, in terms of balancing out the justices and so forth. But what does it look like? and feel like when you get to the other side. And I began, and so my work doesn't let me off the hook. It's like I have to go a little bit deeper. And so that sort of line of thinking has been going through my work since, you know, the very beginning. And yes, I've had people say to me, oh, your work doesn't look like Chicana work. And I say, oh, what does Chicana work look like? And then, of course, <laughs> they kind of, you know, understand what I'm saying. But, um, the other aspect that is, so what I'm saying is by um, beginning to allow ourselves and kind of going to that next level and asking ourselves, making room and time to envision, um, we are in fact um, maybe have the chance to not repeat kind of a overly repeated human pattern and that is that we, we fight and we attempt to make change and maybe even make change but not necessarily fundamental change. So um, with increasingly challenging times that we're experiencing, you know, that's why the envisioning part becomes necessary. So I'm hoping that you'll hold on to that because certainly in this room there are people that are looking at the world and it just, just, just seems like it's, you know, Lord of the Flies out there. But there is great power in being able to envision. It's hard against the onslaught of all of this dysfunction. But at the same time, you know, for a lot of us as artists, especially women artists that have raised families and children, we've had to find our, our center. And when I'm working, um, one of the things that I'm really aware of is that all of that falls back and then messages come forward that I need to recognize or maybe need to hear either personally or as it relates to the world. So, um,
Okay, for some reason this little clicker is not working, Logan. There we go. So this is just to give you a sense of what I just said. This is basically, um, you know, on my website, and but it's the thread that really goes through my work. And, um, and in some ways, uh, you know, I can't run from it. You know, there are many things I could have um, uh, drawn or rendered that might be very quickly understood by, you know, scholars or, you know, they have expectations of us as artists of color, but I, I have not been able to just kind of take that route. I, I, it's this other deeper level exploration that, um, it, you know, that's just kind of like my life as an, an artist. So, um, like I mentioned, that my work does tell me something that I need to know almost always. And so, for me, it's not only been a kind of journaling and transitions of life, but it's given me kind of awareness that um, has affected all parts of my life. I'm going to share with you uh, at the beginning, it's going to be um, a range, uh, this is not in sequential order of work that I have done over time, but this piece, uh, for example, is from 2005. It's a painting that's called It's What I Do, and, and, and it's kind of a segue into ch sort of talking a little bit about sort of some underpinnings uh, that thread through my work. I, I have written that I create work because I must and have, not, and have learned not to overthink anything creative. And for decades, my work has navigated um, moments of daily life and how they reveal the human condition, both internal and external. What I've no noticed um, with young people right now um, that are probably mm, not just the millennials, but the one, maybe the ones before that are younger than that, is they're beginning to say things like, um, it's um, a political act to claim, your, claim joy. And I'm going, yay, I've been waiting for this for 30, 40 years. And the other is that they're also talking about, you know, how it's important that we start looking at our, the human condition, both internal and external. And I'm going like, yay, I'm so glad that that's finally, you know, we're at a point as human beings that it, it's time to be looking at that. Um, one of the things also that goes through the work is sort of the spirit realm. Um, daily living, cultural wisdom that has come by way of a range of people that have been in my life, and the notion of reciprocity um, that comes with sort of a balanced, you know, how a ba balanced natural world should be. Um, and certainly a lot of that derives from sort of our very strong, as you know, based on like the Chicano movement when we were exploring our indigenous side, it, it's very grounded in principles uh, of that. And, you know, I also, before the Chicano movement, have to thank my, my grandfather, my abuelo, um, Basilio Prado, who used to take me for long walks when I was like maybe between four and ten, and talk about all the things that later became things that came up in the 60s movement, but then also in terms of various movements like the Black Panther movement, Chicano movement, uh, indigenous movements, and so forth. So I really have to thank my grandfather. I think of him often. Um, in, in the work, there's um, a range of small truths that can be found in ordinary moments that are really illuminated by history, family, and the unseen spiritual uh, existence. Truth also rests in the overlapping nature of um, past, present, and future. It's a framework that was really better understood by our ancients, like when I think of the Olmeca and the Tolteca in particular, they really understood things that we are just beginning to imagine existed. So, um, you know, that has always been uh, something that has permeated my work. In general, when I think about my work, it informs my life, and, and it's, it's sort of the reciprocity. It, you know, I get informed by it, and it informs me. And certainly as a, a woman of color, um, I have said that, you know, to commit a lifetime to being an artist, you know, I've said for a long time that it was a political act, even though maybe in literal terms people didn't consider that. But I think more and more young people are actually saying that also. So I said, oh, good, yay, I've been waiting for that for about 40 years. Um, so anyway, when you think about um, artistry, like here you'll see... You know, I have my brushes, 
Um, and you know, it's interesting, when I was doing this painting, this little young child, it was a bush first, but it just didn't work, and I was going like, okay, there's something that wants to be there, and this little child insinuated herself in it. And so she popped up, and I said, okay, she's like a very special young person, and I haven't to this day reconciled like what exactly she is, but she's, she's in it. Um, the woman actually, this was like 2005, so this was before tablets. I was doing ceramics for a while and did these tablets, and so she's actually navigating her energy that is showing on her head on these tablets. And then later I realized that, you know, as we have our iPads and our various tablets, those, those things came later. There are many things that I actually drew that maybe came like 25 years later. So it's, you know, that's kind of what artistry does. It opens up doors that you might not otherwise imagine. This was a piece, um, oil painting. There, these are about 48 by 48 inches, so these are probably the smaller pieces that I do these days. But my daughter um, was five years old, and I really wanted to kind of, and she had had a party, and she had like little face painting and stuff done, thus the lipstick, but um, I wanted to capture uh, her at this point because I, with myself, and I suspect with a lot of young people and young women in particular, at about the age of five, you begin to sort of really realize your power. You're starting to realize your power at the exact same time that society is trying to shut it down. So um, while it's my daughter, it also um, is a piece that begins to capture that moment in, in human life, especially for young women. Um, this is a detail of a piece that I did during COVID. I don't do a lot of self-portraits of myself as an adult, but I decided, you know, why not? You know, I'm, I'm sort of like in sheltered just like everybody else was. But I wanted to do something that was more than just a self-portrait. I wanted to have something that really captured a historic moment in time, which was like our pandemic and COVID. And so the butterflies in the background a lot of us were forced to kind of, by Mother Nature and the pandemic, to take a time out. You know, we were benched because, you know, in, in, I shared with people that we were benched because humans have been doing a very lousy job with Mother Earth. And so um, a lot of us were forced to, where no matter how much work we've done, to go through a lot of transformation. So the butterflies in the background represent that. And this is an oil painting 48 by 48. Um, the most recent series I've been working with is, is a water series, and the series is called She Is Water. Um, as many of you know, I, about 25 years ago, I was aware that water was really important and was going to be the issue. Um, but we talked about women as water protectors, water guardians, but what I'm asserting here is that women are in fact water. So she is water, and I tell people, women are in a much more powerful position. They aren't guarding anything, they are water. And so you can interpret that in a range of ways because water can be symbolism for a range of things. This is actually water that I, I was studying different ways of like how to render water and how it manifests. And this is a, I sort of superimposed my granddaughter as she was maybe a couple of weeks old and was in my lap. And so I took a photo and then I was able to you know, render it so that it wasn't too strongly forceful and was more um, woven into the water. Uh, this was one of the earlier pieces that I did of this recent series, and um, the idea is to be able to take her physical form and have it not be so pronounced, where she is water, and then how to... F I was really trying to figure out, like, how do I take her hair, which is water, and make it part of the water, and then, yeah, I sort of all of a sudden really enjoyed coming up with this um, uh, rendering of water that, that makes up also an illumination that goes into the water. And so again, this is one of the water, She Is Water series. Here's a close-up of the canvas um, oil painting. I really enjoy doing oil painting again, by the way, so I've been really having a good time with it. This is uh, one other one. Um, here, um, not only is she water, and I sort of took that same uh, image and sort of um, made her bigger, illuminated the back of her head. Um, and then the feathers are really references to precious knowledge and indigenous wisdom. So I just really felt like it needed to be 
uh, incorporated in this. This is another, um, so I've been doing this dance with water and it's not easy to render water. You have to really give yourself over. And so I wanted to play with it a little bit more and have it be a little bit more light sourced and to kind of play with how the water goes over her shoulder and, and uh, yeah, and how to illuminate even a little bit better. This was one of the earlier ones and if you look just below the midsection, you know, where it looks like it's dark and open. Over to the left was one of my favorite places where, you know, there are different kinds of water here. Like at the top, there's, you know, active water and then there's water that's flowing about mid-course and then, you know, how it spills. So there's a lot of languages of water in this one because water just speaks in so many different ways. And then she is holding, you know, her hand over her heart, which is her heart center, so I wanted to illuminate that. This was the, uh, the first one that I did of the She Is Water series, and this was acrylic, and so that was really the last acrylic one I did, because acrylic is great, but I really like oil, because um, in terms of uh, being able to play with, um, uh, how do you say, blending and all of that, it, this one I en had to actually go back to doing almost like some line work to be able to add gradations. But this was the first one, and you can see how the braid goes down to, like there's some water beginning to show around about her hand, and it drips down and it goes into the, into the water. And this is a close-up of the canvas. Now as I am um, looking at this particular um, piece, this is actually a self-portrait of when I was like around nine. Um, but I was really a fierce little tomboy, so um, most of the time I was in overalls and tennis shoes and running and building forts and playing baseball in the street, but for Sunday we had to, you know, dress up um, for our Sunday best or an Easter. So this basically is a piece, you know, she's holding a, um, a brush, but it's called um, she, uh, We Have Layers. And so um, that's something that could um, really translate you know, for a lot of us um, in terms of our identities. And this is a close-up. I really enjoyed doing the baseball because I really, ooh, I love playing baseball, or used to. And then the jacks, a lot of us, and then, you know, we had our, our tennis shoes from that, during that time period. Um, this is a more recent drawing that I did specifically for the mural. Um, this is seven feet by about seven feet, and it's going to be 23 feet high by about maybe 18, 19 feet wide, but it's going to be one of the pieces that are going to be um, part of the um, murals that I'm working on in San Francisco. And this is called Claiming Joy. I just feel like we just have to claim joy. Um, because yes, we struggle, but we also have to make time to claim joy. Um, this um, piece um, really, I was going through some really, you know, we all go through some really difficult periods, and so I wanted to do a piece. This is referencing precious knowledge, indigenous wisdom, and I, this piece really had to do with um, releasing sorrow and, and going to sort of the next level of how you make the transition from sorrow. This piece is a charcoal. I like to go back and forth. I really enjoy doing black and white work. And sometimes I go in and out because they're different dances. You discover different things. So this piece is 2015, and it's called um, uh, Natural History. And what I mean by that is there's natural history that we understand in the Western, Western kind of paradigm, and then there's natural history that occurred that we don't really hear about because it's been erased, like uh, is sort of happening all over again. <laughs> Um, and so um, uh, she, uh, all the hands that are in the background, those are all the people that came before her and all the people that ever will come. So this is an example of, of a close-up of a piece. And I think I did this on site at the Galleria when I was having my retrospective. Um, people love to actually see artists working in real time. So this will give you a sense of like the scale um, of that piece as well. Um, this one is called Standing in Power, and the reason why, you know, the feet are way up at the top is because the energy that she's standing in is that in the middle that looks non-representational. 
So this is a close-up. This is a pastel, and it's seven feet by seven feet. This one is a piece that I was very nervous about doing because I thought, gee, it's only hair, but hair is so powerful to many cultures because hair is memory, hair is a lot of things. Um, and so I did this piece, and um, I actually ended up really in, uh, having it be one of my favorite pieces. It's also pastel. And, um, and I think this is called Wisdom, Wisdom to Strength. And then this, will, this is me standing next to it, so it'll give you a little sense of the scale. Um, one of the things that I think before COVID and actually maybe even during COVID, you know, as they were taking children and separating them from families, you know, we'd become so numb in some ways to um, all the onslaught of injustices that are going on out there and uh, to our humanity. And so when the children... Um, like, they didn't have to say anything. They just showed us their suffering. And, and when I say that children have things to tell us, it was really at that moment that a lot of people, um, they tapped people's humanity in their heart center. And so when I say that children have things to tell us something, it's really within that spirit that it, the children tapped our humanity, which we needed to have tapped at that point. So this is called Children Make It Rain, and it makes reference to, you know, when people make it rain, you know, they think about people that, you know, like raise money and all of that, but children make it rain, that means that they bring to us, um, they have the ability to bring to us what we need to hear and know at this point in time in our human existence. Um, this piece, um, there comes a moment when especially as women and people of color, I'll just sort of say it, where, you know, there are all these things that happen, whether they're microaggressions or just actual aggressions, that, um, you know, you just get really, it's exhausting. And so she's really at the point where she's just doing that side eye and kind of saying, you know, uh, I, that, that's it, you know. And so she's basically taking a very deep breath is what this is called. Um, because we've all had those moments. And this will give you a sense of the scale of this pastel also. This particular piece is a charcoal, and it was, um, uh, it's, it, it's actually called Navigating by Hand, and it again, it references, you see her hand on this uh, sculpture, and I actually, you'll see this sculpture later, I rarely ever do a drawing of a, an art piece, but this is, her hand on this, navigating, and she's actually training another young indigenous a healer um, in this. And so um, this is actually the collection of Dr. Sandra Pacheco. She just, she, she chased me down until uh, she said, I want to buy this. And so anyway, it is not part of her collection. This particular piece is called Lamar. Um, you know, like I said, I often don't know what it's going to tell me till the very end, and then after, and, and this piece also, you know, I started out with an idea of how it was going to go, and it said, no, we're going to go this way, then we're going to go this way, and so I just kind of kept, I just, you know, you just let go and let it happen. And then after about the third day of it being done, I was sitting on a stool kind of looking at it, and then I realized, oh my goodness, it's like energetically I understood that this was my late daughter Lamar that I lost at birth. And this is what she looked like. She looks like now in her full power. And so um, I know people like kind of stunned by that, but it wasn't a painful moment. It's as if she came to visit me and said, I'm actually, I'm, I'm all right. And, and I'm in my full power right now. So um, this one is actually available on my website for, I had it reproduced with such detail that even I'm afraid that to touch it because I think it's going to smear. And at the same time, it's a beautiful print that's on actual paper that I did the drawing on. This is about seven feet high. And that, you know, it can be uh, purchased on online for significantly less than the original would cost. So just a little something for you to think about. And this will give you a sense of the scale. This was a gentleman that was going to frame the print this is a print. Um, he was going to frame it for the late um, Maria, uh, uh, Maria X. Martinez, who um, bought one of the prints. 
This piece um, is another pastel, and it is called, um, let me see here, oh yeah, it's sun, moon, earth, and Noor aligned. Um, and Noor is my granddaughter, and she's still little, she just is five now. Um, but she kind of came forward in this, I realized this was her in her full power sometime in the future. And so um, I don't think she's seen this. So, you know, um, this was done actually for an exhibit that happened here in Sacramento that I think Rudy Cuellar curated. This is a close-up. I really like working in this, you know, uh, it would be easy to take all of these lines and, you know, rub them in and smooth them and make them really photorealistic, but I really just like the energy of being able to see the line work, and then you can also see how many layers of color it takes to arrive at that. It kind of lets you see that. I really like working with lines, so maybe that, that's one of the reasons why I just continue to, to, you know, work in this way. And I'm also implementing this um, on the mural work, because the work that I'm working on with the mural, um, it's a really good Nova paint, but it's water-based, and so it dries fast, so, you know, blending, you, you know, you can go back and do this, and, and, it, and it's actually really working well for, like, a technique to use on a mural, a, a large-scale mural. And this is, uh, you know, uh, I work in my uh, living room, actually. I move everything over, and powder goes everywhere, but, you know, that's what it is. This is a piece like 1990. Um, this one is probably six feet by about four and a half feet, and it's also charcoal. This was a time period when I was still continuing to use the roughest paper I could find, and so I thought about making my own paper, but then I found watercolor cold press paper and the softest charcoal I could get so that I could actually, I work in a circle and it just hits the nubs of the paper and creates this, um, pattern, but what's going on here, it's, it's called in retrospect, and this woman, as you see, is a bit emaciated. She's actually thinking about all that she's given, how she's just really given too much, it's not sustainable. The vines there have dropped their leaves, and she's looking at all the loss, um, and that how she has to really regroup her life, and the stones that are kind of hovering are really the weight of what she's been carrying, but she's ready to make a change. And now, speaking of red shoes, this is a diptych that I did of my daughter. In fact, I actually took a string and measured her as I was doing this, my daughter Monica, when she was little. And um, it's called the red shoes. And if any of you have... Um, I, I was born in 1950, so patent leather shoes first came out. First they came out black, and then they came out white. But it's when the red shoes came out <laughs> that I was really excited. And I didn't really understand then what it was, but... I began to realize that, you know, if you read the book, uh, Women Who Run With Wolves, she unpacks a story about the red shoes. And um, it's a book by Clarissa Pincola Estes, and you really should get it if you're a woman. But if you want to understand our perspective, men, you should read it too. But it unpacks all kinds of uh, stories and to sort of talk about how the patriarchy have sort of tried to tamp down our, our power. So the red shoes... Um, here she's looking down, and this is where she's looking up, and they s sort of sit side by side. Um, and this is, you know, one of my favorite um, pieces. And this also I have had um, digitally uh, captured in great detail and is also available. You could buy either one or both online. But, um, yeah, it's called The Red Shoes. This will give you a sense of scale. You'll see navigating by hand and also the diptych side by side. Um, and the same here. Um, on the left, you'll see this uh, persona. She started appearing to me in 1974, um, and it's Alma. And Alma just pops through in my work all the time. So over time, you know, she kept popping through and, and going through transitions and forcing me through transitions. And so um, this piece I actually drew when I was at doing a residency with the RCAF at the Kimball Gallery at the De Young Museum. This is a diptych, and it's called um, Facio Nova Omnia, which means, it's Latin for I make new all things. And um, this is the indigenous uh, woman, and over to the right, and I'll show her in a minute, is the, uh, the colonial version, like the Spanish version of, of like my identity. And 
I came to a point, like many, that yes, in the 50s, we went, um, you know, they, they just called us Spanish, and even though we're Mexican, and they, anyway, it was just kind of a screwy, screwy time for identity. But it was really in the 60s that we ran towards our indigenous identity, exploring that, and sort of cast off the colonial. But there is a time where you have to realize that for centuries we have all been indoctrinated, and yes, we talk about decolonizing, but it's, it, we have all been indoctrinated. And so there comes a point where you have to take your colonial side and in this case, instead of the colonial side leading the indigenous side, the indigenous side is informing and helping the colonial side to become a fuller, happier, powerful woman. So this is the colonial side of, of the, um, the diptych. And then you'll get a close-up. This is also pastel, and these are also uh, seven feet high. This piece is a pastel, and fundamentally, she just kind of came forward, but she's a, a, an entity in her full power, and this is the collection of David Bischoff. And you know, I was really moved. Um, his his when his wife passed, he told me that she told him, "When I go, I want this to be the last thing I see." And I was my heart center just exploded. Um, so um, it, it he has the original, and it is a not as big as the others, but it, um, I really, yeah, I felt very attached to this piece. This is called The Alchemist, and long story short is that this is a woman that's very much in her power. She doesn't even feel like she owes you, um, that she has to turn around and like look at you, because she's busy studying. She's busy studying and trying to be her full manifested self, and I actually have a little ruby stone on her finger on purpose. So, and this is the collection of Dr. Sandra Anandes because she it really resonated with her. So she asked me one day, I really would like to buy that, and I said okay, because I really see that it's also part of her identity and persona. This was a piece I was asked to do for Dia de los Muertos, and and I often I don't often do things that are so culturally like. Um, you know, like things like for Day of the Dead, but I really wanted to do something that hinted at their physical form before these children passed away and became little spirit selves. And this was really based on a photo that I that we had that was taken of me and two of my sisters where I think it was my grandfather was saying, okay, let me take this picture. We were Oroville, the sun was really bright, and we were like, hurry up, hurry up. And so really, it, that's why it's called Say Cheese. <laughs> now, um, Right about the time I started writing a, a sort of a, me a memoir, um, I was also starting to do some um, self-portraits of me and my little young self. So here, I was really happy when I could run around and just build rafts and play ball and just lizards in my pocket. And, and so this is me, you know, right ab about the age of 10. And it's a charcoal, it's seven feet, and it's part of a series. This is called um, Friends No Matter What, which is Charcoal and Conte. And basically, the two of us are playing a hide-and-seek game, but at the same time, we're making a pact that we're going to be friends no matter what. And it's a kind of comment about, you know, the, you know, the 50s, early 60s, where, you know, there were still some really horrific things going on, and so um, it was a pact that I, that I made. Um, this one is very tongue-in-cheek. It's also like seven feet, but in the 60s, 70s, quinceañeras were a very colonial kind of construct, and a lot of us were like, no, nah, we don't want a quinceañera, because it was just, it, was, it has a lot of like things about it, even with gender, that was problematic for us. But this one is called, what? No quinceañera? Which is meant to be tongue-in-cheek. And so... Um, that, you know, this would have been like me during the time when I would have had a quinceañera. But, um, you know, this is a, a close-up. And again, you know, I, I utilize the texture of the hands and so forth. But my favorite part of it, to be honest, it, is the rendering of the shoes and the glove. And everybody that knows me knows that I wear gloves a lot because I'm in San Francisco and it's chilly and I, I'm a microphobe, I mean a germaphobe, and so I wear gloves like when I'm in Muni and stuff. So I, there, if I... Even if I just did nothing else but the shoe and the hand, and, um, I really just enjoyed that black and white image. This one's of the same series, and you know I have a hula hoop because anyone in the 50s had a hula hoop. This was a close up. 
Now, this particular series is um, older. It's like began in the 80s, and, and, and I was really wanting to work with highly textured. I didn't want to use any line. Um, I just wanted to work with like shades of black and white. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I've always been like a little bit of a science nut, and I understood, um, you know, as you look back to the Olmec and the Tolteca, I, I believe they could teleport. They understood, you know, physics in a way that we're only beginning to imagine. And I can say, like, let's say if my hand, if I could get the, like, we aren't solid. It's just our molecules are moving. They're just moving at different rates. So if I could get the rate of my hand molecules to be the same as this um, podium, I would be able to put my hand through it. But we don't have the ability to do that. Five minutes. OK, so I'm going to have to hurry through. Um, but um, also, this was had to deal with like a window series, which had to do with the fact that we're all born with like a you know a window that we're supposed to p keep clean, and we're supposed to um, do it for the sake of being able to see where we're going in our lives. And in this particular like image of like a window, she actually makes connection with the membrane of the window, and so it's called our connection. So I'm going to just run through these a little quick so that you can kind of see some of those. Um, now I'm looking at the Southside Park, 1977. This was the original drawing for the two panels that I did that really dealt with the chakras on the body. And then um, to the right is me and, and Jose Montoya with our flight suits. This um, was a sketch that I did. When we would take breaks, we really had wonderful conversations. So on the left um, is Jose Montoya, Juanishi Orozco, and then myself in the center. I was talking to Juanishi about this drawing, so he'll eventually see this on YouTube, and um, I told him he'll be able to see all of this. This is 1977. Here's Juanishi, and it's like full-blown youth, and you know me and my 1966 little bug, and me with that little kind of Afro thing going on that I had on my head, and the beginnings of a panel. And then this is a little close-up of uh, us in our flight suits. Um, I really like working sometimes just in line. So I'm going to run through. Um, I did about 40 drawings that were about 36 by 36, I think. And the whole idea was just to do line. You know, no shading, no nothing, just line, because I really enjoy. But, um, you know, if you, it, and these are large dra larger drawings. Like, the, I did a lot of drawings in sketchbooks, but I began to realize that, well, what a waste to have it just in a sketchbook. Really quickly, I did a monoprint series that dealt with, um, you know, uh, the issue of milagros, identity, family healing, and the next generation. So this is called Family Line. And, you know, uh, the little character on the right that's kind of like the little drunken clown, he's always in these to remind us not to take ourselves so seriously. This is my uh, a photo of my grandparents on my mom's side, and my mom and, and my uncle and my aunt, who are now gone. This one deals with, um, well, so do you want the truth or you want to stay happy, which you know, Juan and I talked about like the truth earlier, and it's like, but these deal with dated material, whether it be like John Wayne or this expectation of beauty or expectation of purity of young girls. Um, this one dealt with like you know the violence in the world, and at the same time introduces the bean, which you know we've been called beaners in derogatory terms, but in the same way that the Black Panthers reclaimed black and said black is beautiful, I reclaim the bean as um, you know that's our substance. That's that's sort of the basis of like our being able to survive. So um, I'm just going to kind of run through this. This is like an Abacus uh, reference. Here, the beans are on us that we have to carry around, almost like rice cakes around us. But this particular one is the one where you see the little character there, but it's like all those stereotypes come towards you, but then you find a way to release them and just keep them moving. Um, those morphed into an envelope series, which um, I still I started using tags as the milagros, still monoprint, but the envelopes inside carry an affirmation of things I wanted to affirm for the world or myself. And I've long since forgotten, but the energy of them, they continue to produce that. So um, this envelope series, this is my mother on the left and myself on the right. Um, these are, uh, this is my mother and my aunt. This is a self-portrait. And then they morphed into bar relief, um, a repurposed styrofoam that I made look like stone. And this one is called The Wish, which um, 
is uh, curators have gone to pick them up and really go like this, and they realize, like, oh, it's not stone because they, like, lift it up really. And Juan, this one is for you. This is during the time when I was pinching my brain and I did the milag uh, the ex photo and the, um, you know, the uh, paintings on tin. So this was like 13 inches by like whatever. All I know is my brain hurt. But this one is, um, I did a take on The Last Supper, but you know how difficult it was for us at the Arts Council to make decisions about who gets money during our panel discussions. And I just wanted to show sort of how difficult it was. So Juan is in the middle. I'm over here with the black hair and page boy, and everybody's like, you know, struggling. And, and Sherry, um, who is no longer with us, was someone that kind of assisted um, me during that time. Um, so anyway, this is um, called The Last Supper. This is another one, a painting on tin called uh, The Allies. And then this one is another one. And then I did a whole series of things that just dealt with energy, just straight out energy. And this was, there were quite a few of them. And this was the last one. And this was where it all like landed and it's called The Source. This one was more recent. It's my, uh, it's mother and uh, son in solidarity. It really references my solidarity with him as a, as a gay male. And during COVID, I was asked to do some pieces. So this is Ruby Bridges, who you know was uh, the first to integrate during the 1953, something like that. And so this is called the Protected Series. So I actually, for COVID, I, I referenced Ruby and I had the shield and, you know, um, uh, very specifically, it's, it, you, I don't have to explain why it's called Protected Series, but it's also like dealt during COVID times. This one is called Precious Knowledge and it's a Hopi child. Um, the same uh, reference. And then this is um, Alma when she was a sculpture. I used to do Alma in clay. I also did Alma in acrylic. And this was probably around 1974. And then this was a really old one. This is one I did in 1968, 67, when I was still in high school. It was my first oil painting where I started to really use like bright colors and start to really understand the use of it. And so this is, I did with a palette knife and a brush. And this is probably around 1974, about five feet high. I've done installation work. This was one where I did with missing and murdered women, both of Mexico and um, in terms of our indigenous sisters and brothers. This was in San Francisco. Uh, Self-help graphics, I was asked to do uh, uh, silk screen. So I was one of the first people to introduce the idea of doing photo silk down there. And so this was a tribute to my mother. This is the mural I'm working on right now. So this is the roof, the ceiling, and it's 1,670 square feet. Um, the young girl, it's about, you know, you can kind of see the, the dimensions, but it's about three stories where the feather is. You can see on the right that mother-daughter image. I'm going to, you know, render that with more color, and there'll be some clouds. And then I just finished the, uh, the, the, young, the young woman. And this is her, I haven't finished, I, when I took this photo, I hadn't finished rendering the bottom of her um, clothes yet. But this is like two stories. Um, this is across, the, on the other side, you can see Claiming Joy is going to be there. And then this gentleman that could, I wanted to have someone that was kind of native but contemporary, but he could also be Asian, he could also, you know, so wearing glasses kind of put him within contemporary. And I'll probably have something saying, I haven't decided in terms of the language, but right now that says take only what you need. And that was really something that I went on on Leduc said many years ago, where she says take only what you need and leave the rest. That way the world will be more balanced and that is easier to live than it is to say. And I want to close with just honoring my colleagues with the uh, RCAF, because the RCAF for me has been family. And uh, with the you know, Esteban on the right has departed. Rudy clearly is like still the coyote that he is. He's still with us. Ricardo Favela, I, I, amazing person. He fired all my work. He was a very generous like person, and I never laughed so hard as when he and I would go up elevators and just. And then of course Juan Carillo, we know Armando Cid is pictured here, and then myself. We were doing a panel discussion at State, I think, in 2005, and then Jose Montoya is over to one side. And then this is the photo that we took just in time before people started passing. Um, and I will uh, sort of end with 
with that image. And you know, all, uh, what I'd like to just kind of say um, in the end, in closing, is that you know, I, today I hope that it's more than just like, okay, here's one piece, here's that, here's how big this is, you know, what I use in terms of materials. But I hope that I've been able to share something about the creative process and how it's a vehicle that can thread and sort of be essential to navigating our lives. And hopefully I was able to relay some ideas and concepts that, concepts that may just assist you in your own life journey. Because really in the end, you know, we're, we're here, whether we know it or not, to be fully manifest. We have to figure out like what in our last lives we were intending to do in this life, and that's part of the work. But um, the creative process really has been a way to illuminate the way. And so to that end, you know, I, my mantra right now at almost 73 is I want to be fully manifest. So I want to thank you so much for your time. I want to thank, you know, Craig, I, I didn't see you earlier, my nephew and, and his wife. I, it's really a pleasure that you're here. And um, uh, be fully manifest in your life. Don't settle for less. Thank you so very much. Thank, thank you so much, Lorraine. We're so appreciative of, of seeing your work and you sharing with us. And it was, it was brilliant, just brilliant. Thank you. Uh, we have some time for some questions. If there's anyone that uh, would like to ask, Scott, we've got one in the back here. I was just wondering if, oh, I was just wondering if any of your um, line uh, drawings or line pictures are available in smaller sizes. But yes, um, I'm glad you asked that. I have, um, you know, they're about this size, so they're this, they're small but frameable. Um, I have uh, the original drawings, and I also have five of them that I had reproduced. They look like lithographs almost, so I do, I do have that, and I can give you my card, and then you know we can talk about you know the ones, and the price point is really decent on the uh, the reproductions, and you know, yes, the answer is yes, I do have them, and I would love to be able to share, have them be part of your life. Other questions? Oh, there's one over here. Um, it's, it's not a question, but I can't begin to tell you how meaningful this has been to me. Um, although I was an art major at university, I, I just focused on art history because I had, had no talent. But um, I, this has been absolutely amazing to me because it, I'm repeating myself, but it was so mm. meaningful I just might take an art class. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that, and, and you should definitely do. Lorraine, I just want to uh, say to you that I've known you for, since you were in college. <laughs> Our Yuba, 20s. <laughs> Yuba City girl. Um, anyway, it, uh, I am just blown out that I see so much work because you're everywhere. You're, you're, you're in Washington, D.C., you're all over San Francisco, you're here, you're, you, you move around. I don't know where you have time to do this work because obviously each piece takes so much attention and time, the detail, the, and, and yet there's so much that I've never seen before and what a pleasure it is for me to now know more <laughs> about you. Thank you. Well, thank you for saying that one. I know that with our my RCF family, you know, I've we've you've seen pieces here, pieces there, even like the envelope series and the sculptures in the early days. But it, it, this, yes, this kind of was sampling because like I have so much more work than this. But this is a sampling of different transitional pieces, and it doesn't really include like a lot of the sculpture I did. But um, uh, yeah, the thing about about um, that I didn't share is that in terms of the, how I had the time, 
I did, I used to oil paint a lot, but I was like a marathon painter. I would like paint for like 12 hours straight. And like, I'm kind of doing that again because I don't have to kids to take to school and all of that. But um, because I wanted to continue doing work, I started doing pastel because you can walk away, go make dinner, help with homework, and then come back. And so that was a reason why I stopped painting and, and doing pastel and for so many years. It was strategic and practical because as a woman, as a parent, um, as someone that works, you know, has other lives that you're doing, you, you, I knew that I needed to do the work. It wasn't that I just wanted to do it. So I also learned to be able to knock out, like, you know, I could do one of those big drawings in like a day and a half to three days because I just, you know, you have the vocabulary and I have my ladder and my surgical gloves so that I don't wear away my fingers too much. But yeah, thank you for that. I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> any any other questions? Oh, one over here, real quick. More of a comment. Thank you very much. I think it was divine intervention for myself, um, my cousins, my grandma who's from Colorado, and oh. my mom. We're all Mexicans, and we. Um, just thought about coming here today and to see the the word or to hear the words from you and to see your artwork is inspiring none of us are artists <laughs> um, but i feel um, motivated encouraged and uh, very much inspired by your work today so give thank me you. your name dominique 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 harris thank you for being here and thank you for representing colorado thank you and yes, just you don't have to be doing artistic work to be living a creative life. You can, you know, even raising children or how you situate your home or how you operate in the community, there's, there's ways to make that happen. So uh, the bottom line is to understand that, yes, we all came into these lives and we have to figure out like what we told ourselves we were going to do, but you want to be fully manifest because... Otherwise, it's like, why, yeah, like I don't understand like not wanting to be fully manifest in your life. And it's not easy because things work against you, but you just make time. I hear you, and thank you <laughs> so much. Thank you. Great, thank you. I just had one last question I wanted to ask Lorraine about. Um, because I've known you for so long, I know that you worked for a time at San Quentin, and you ah, worked yeah. with inmates on death row. And I just wonder, you know, if you could tell us just briefly what that experience was like, and how it impacted your work at that time. Well, interestingly enough, I think I might have drawn one of the red shoes at San Quentin. We, we were, um, at that time, the warden was uh, Danny Vasquez. And um, he was he was fun, uh, actually, if you can even say that about a, a warden. But he was. He, was, he really understood... Um, you know, recidivism and not, you know, trying to create things that were meaningful for people that were going to be there a long time because there were lifers there. That was a level four institution when I was there. So I work with the lifers, but I also work with people in Condemned Row that he would assign me to d do certain things. And so we, he arranged for us to have like an art center. I mean, you still had people walking around with their shotguns and stuff that, you know, but you, it, it's this duality, like, okay, we as Latinos, Chicanos, women, have long understood the word duality. So for me, it's like, okay, I have to be there and be human and real, and I also have to be conscious of, of you know, where I was. And so it was exhausting because you are being human, but you also have to, you know, you never give over information about yourself. And there's, you know, like I, I would like scamper to somewhere and then out of like the speaker, you know, someone would say, Garcia, no running. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, you know, it was, I had to be reminded that it was a, you know, prison. And there, you know, I always wore my lab coat because, you know, people that know me know I wear a white lab coat and it'd be like paint spots and all that. And so I went in to have something signed or he needed something. And I'd walk in and the warden would say, oh, Garcia, the, the surgery didn't go so well, huh? And, and we both like laugh. Um, and then, you know, we would have in the art center, I would teach at night drawing, which is why I did, you know, one of the red shoes in there. Um, 
And I, I did this really simple thing because you had bikers, you had, you know, our black brothers and sisters, you had, you know, and they don't hang with each other in the yard, but this was the one place where they could be together and feel safe from everybody else's eyes judging them because they're being too friendly with, you know, another um, cultures. So one of the first things I would do is like I brought in like either M&Ms or like some little thing and I'd give it to one and sort of the act of passing it to each other was kind of meaningful. I also played music because I always did that when I would teach with the State Summer School for the Arts or when I taught college. I like the music, just kind of, they don't feel so self-conscious. Um, but I have to say, th there were moments when, you know, by the time they were drawing and doing what, whatever, um, that uh, we would sometimes have some bend over laughing kind of laughs. So I would like leave late in the evening and the lights would be twinkling in them over Marin and twinkling over the lights of San Quentin and I'd be walking out going, this is really weird, I feel really joyful and happy and I'm leaving San Quentin. It almost doesn't make sense. So there are a lot of um, stories, but I think in a nutshell, um, I, I also like taught um, a couple of people that were doing little small drawings, kind of like how my sisters were doing, and then I taught them how to work bigger and working in charcoal, and they actually, one of them was really good. In fact, he did a drawing for me, and when, you know, they transfer people without notice. So he came running over and he says, I didn't finish it, but I did a portrait of you, and so it, I have it. And, um, and it became actually a way where it was, uh, you know, people trade services, bartering so that they could get what they need and so oh he got really busy making drawing um, people were saying do the drawing of me doing you know of my daughter and you know so that they could send back to their family so because he was going to be in there a long time I'm talking people were already there 40 years and some people had been in there since they were 18 and they were 40 um, so it's just it's it's different but I, I learned a lot about humanity duality and also that what art can do to a person's life well, Lorraine, thank you again. I just, it was brilliant. Thank you so much.